Good morning. What a blessing it is to be here today. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to welcome you as we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ in worship and in praise of our glorious King, right? You know, last week we began this sermon series called Airplane Mode. And in that series, as we began, we looked at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, and we talked about how he's our Father who is in heaven, and oh, how his name is separate and set apart, right? He's our glorious King. He's our eternal Father. He's the one in whom loves us. He's the one in whom reigns over us. He's the one who is compassionate to us. He's the one who is our rightful judge. He is our God, and there is none like Him. And we talked about as you begin your prayers, as you first reflect, as we look at Jesus giving this model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, we talked about how when we approach the throne of God, who do we see? When we first go to God in prayer, who is it that's on our heart in the very beginning? Who is prayer really all about? Always. Who is prayer glorifying? It's our God in heaven, right? Now, we, you've heard it mentioned many times in the last several weeks. You may have gotten text messages from me. We began, we're beginning something this Thursday, November 22nd, called the 40 Days of Prayer. The reason why we're doing 40 days is because oftentimes in Scripture, what's the common pattern that you see whenever an individual or a group of individuals were beginning to undertake something major? When they were beginning, you think about Jesus beginning his ministry, right? He was fasting 40 days in the wilderness. You can look at many other sources, many other accounts, Moses, many other individuals that we read in Scripture, that 40 days, they took some time and they prayed and they meditated on what was to come. You and I, we have something awesome coming up, and that's the year 2019, right? Amen. 2019 is going to be an awesome year. 2018 was a blessed year, but 2019, we're going to try to do better. We're going to try to grow stronger together, right? We're going to try to be pleasing in the sight of our God. And what better way to begin that year off than with praying together, showing the community of fellowship that we have as brothers and sisters in word and in prayer. Now, Outside, once again, as Mark had mentioned earlier, there are packets that are, I don't know, we, is it, what did we call it, Mark, a credenza, whatever that thing is in the foyer that we put bulletins on and all that stuff, shelf, whatever you want to call it. There are these packets out there. And on, in those packets, those are just a guided list of everything for the next 40 days we want to be mindful of. Everything for the next 40 days we want to be mindful of, beginning November 22nd. And if you want to, once again, Cody will be standing out there in the foyer. He'll be handing those out. That's just something that comes with verses, some things that Cody and I were thinking like, wow, how can we begin initiating these prayers? If you're struggling with some of the things on the list, like, I don't even know what to pray for this. We've got some things that can help get the prayer started. And so that's something for you to keep, something for you to take home, because ultimately we don't want to just develop a prayer life for just 40 days, right? One of the true purposes of this is to develop a pattern that continues on for the rest of our life. Let me tell you, if you already have a very strong prayer life, I pray that after these 40 days, it's even stronger. If you have looked at your own personal prayer life, I've looked at mine, I've reflected at mine, and I say, man, I know it can be stronger, then we hope that within the next 40 days, after November 22nd and through the new year, we continue that pattern of prayer. Now, we've been going through this series once again in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 9. We've been looking at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 through the end of the section on prayer. You know, many call it the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. And we talked about, just as was mentioned earlier, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. And we talked about how, once again, using that idea of airplane mode. Because when you're in a plane and when they tell you shut off your phones, typically, you don't want to be that guy who doesn't do it because you don't want to be the guy who gets blamed if something happens, right? You shut off your phone, you turn off anything that can can distract the plane. They say it can interfere with navigation. They say it can interfere with communication. You don't want anything that could hinder the travel, right? What's well, the same thing in prayer? We shut off everything else, all the other distractions, right? Take time to be holy. Cutting off everything else in the midst of that prayer to be able to focus on one thing, God and his will for humanity and taking time to just connect daily with our God, to leave beside the worries, the distractions. And if you have them, if they're still with you in that prayer, then you give it to Him. It's all about giving it back to Him. And now this morning, we're going to begin looking at verse 10. Purpose. You know, oftentimes, I have started off a prayer, 
and I thought it had a direction that it was supposed to go, and I had all these different things that I talked about, but I really forgot what my ultimate purpose as a Christian is in a lot of my prayers. I, I forget that sometimes. And maybe you're the same way. And in this passage, Jesus talks about first and foremost, when you go to God in prayer, who do you reflect on? You reflect on God, right? You look to Him. You see Him in His sovereignty. You know that you can have confidence in God Almighty, the God that you talk to. The reason why we need to shape our mind to look at God Almighty is because how can I trust that my prayer is going to be answered. How can I trust that God's will is sovereign if I don't first see Him as sovereign? If I don't first see Him as holy? And now in this next section, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 together. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, we're going to break down this section over the next two weeks, at least this verse, into two separate parts. And he talks about in this verse, after he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To be kingdom-minded. You know, the word kingdom in the New Testament is mentioned roughly 162 times, predominantly in reference to the church, in reference to God's rule of his people. I think early back, one of the early occurrences in Scripture that we find the word kingdom in reference to the church is in a prophecy by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 in which in the days of those kings, you know, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, he's prophesying the fall of the Babylonian Empire, the rise of the other empires, kind of like what we've been talking about in our morning class. And then he says, but in the days of those kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, there will come a kingdom that will be everlasting, that will endure forever. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 through 19, if you remember in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus, okay, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say that you're Elijah, one of the prophets. Okay, but who do you say that I am? They all kind of freeze up, but Peter, right? And what does Peter say? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and what is What's, what's, what's Jesus' response to Peter on that? He says, upon this confession, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, right? And then he says to them, and I will give to you, the disciples, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know, there are other passages of scripture that reference the kingdom. You remember uh, Jesus when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. He even told Nicodemus himself, unless you, be, unless you be of water and of spirit, unless you are born again of water and spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom. Now, we fast forward a little bit. And even in Luke chapter 9 and verse 27, Jesus himself told those that were gathered around him, he says, there are going to be some of you standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 27, in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. But then I think back to Acts chapter 2. You know, you think in Acts chapter 1, actually. In Acts chapter 1, you remember Jesus' disciples. They're like, okay, you've been talking a lot about this kingdom. You've been talking a lot about this kingdom. When is it going to come? Are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6? And then what do we see in Acts chapter 2? kingdom is established. As a matter of fact, when we look at scripture, we think about as Jesus was saying this prayer, when we think about as Jesus was saying this prayer, had the kingdom at his point been established yet? When he says, your kingdom come, your will be done, had the kingdom at this point been established? No. So, you know, I've heard ministers say, well, then at that point, we don't pray about the kingdom. We, we just move on and we go into your will be done as it is on earth and heaven. Uh, but what is he really trying to get at the core of it all? He's trying to say, be kingdom-minded. He's trying to remind them, look, at this point, you and I are a part of the kingdom today, right? If you're in Christ, according to the verse that was read to us in our scripture reading, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, that you have been delivered from the domain of darkness and you were transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And when Paul's saying that, he's saying that in present tense. He's saying we are now a part of that kingdom. He says where there is, he said, in the beloved son who in whom there is redemption and forgiveness of sins. Now when we think about that, what should I be praying about then? Jesus is reminding his disciples, be kingdom-minded. Pray with purpose. Pray with priority. Focus on the kingdom. Don't forget the kingdom. You know, we think about the kingdom, the kingdom, the church. 
It's not a physical kingdom, right? It's not a kingdom that has borders. It's not a kingdom that has a castle or an earthly headquarters. No, it has a heavenly headquarters. It doesn't have an earthly king. It has a heavenly king. And it's a kingdom that's not made of just one nation, but a kingdom that comprises many nations that span the test of time. Amen? That is the kingdom by which you are a part of. If you're in Christ, that's the kingdom by which I'm a part of. The kingdom is the place where unity is found. The kingdom is the place where peace is found. Remember, we talk about that in our Ephesians class, right? About unity and peace. That is where it's found. And if you are in the kingdom, you have unity. You have peace. The kingdom is populated. The church, once again, kingdom, church, is populated by Christians. And as a Christian, as one who makes up, and I'm talking about myself, as one who makes up that population, as a citizen of the kingdom, I need to be about my king's business. I need to remind myself that prayer isn't just about me. Prayer isn't just about what I need. There's an element to that, and he does talk about that later on in his model prayer, but that's not what it's all about. Prayer is an opportunity that you and I as brothers and sisters get to go to our God on behalf of the work that we're engaged in. Prayer is an opportunity that we get to trust in God's will and know without a shadow of a doubt that you and I are a part of something amazing, that you and I are a part of something holy, that you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ are a part of a royal family, a royal priesthood, right, as Peter describes it, you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ are servants to the Most High, and we are children of the King of the universe. Have you stopped and recognized that you are a part of the kingdom, and do your prayers, my prayers, reflect that? We're doing this 40 days of prayer. Most of the things are predominant on that list. There are some things that focus inwardly. But a lot of things on that list are about what's going on in the kingdom, the work in India. Some of the works that we support here, works that you may not have even heard of, some things that are going on in the church right now, things that we're excited about here, it's kingdom church-minded. And we keep thinking about this idea of being kingdom-minded. I need to be praying for the furtherance of the kingdom, the furtherance of the church. I need to be praying for the growth of the kingdom. I need to be praying for my brothers and sisters who are also fellow citizens in the kingdom. I need to be kingdom-minded. See, here's the thing. To be kingdom-minded sets the prayerful mind right. It places a strong priority. It reminds you that you're not doing Christianity on your own. Notice how he even begins the prayer. How does he say, our Father who is in heaven? Because typically in Jewish communal prayer, and even in private prayer, they said, our, even when they were praying to their God, it's not that they couldn't say, my God. They couldn't, it's not that that was wrong in and of itself, but they wanted to always be mindful that I'm not just, it's not just me and God. I'm a part of a community of believers. I'm a part of people. I'm a part of a family. Our God, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom. And it's another thing to remember. It reminds us, it sets the priority right that at the end of the day, the work of the church is to please and glorify the king. That what we do here, what we do week after week, what we do day in as, as fellow citizens, even in our own work lives, even in our own family lives, what we do each and every day is to be about the king and the kingdom's business. It places a priority, an emphasis that you're not doing this alone. You know, for example, we have this 40 days of prayer list, right? I'm, I'm personally really excited about it. I'm excited to see people talking about it. Like, man, yeah, well, I was praying about that today. You were praying about it too. It's just awesome that we're praying about the same things. Not to say that you don't have your own individual prayers throughout the day. I hope you do. I hope you're praying about other things as well. But to make a conscious effort as a community, as citizens of the kingdom, to be unified in prayer together. You know, the church met every single day in the first century. In our current culture, that's hard to do that, right? But we can be praying together, even if we're not in the same room. You think about it, we're worshiping right now with brothers and sisters. Even though you and I are together in this room, there are brothers and sisters all across the globe. I know of brethren in Texas who are meeting right now. I know of brethren in England. I think they're meeting in a couple more hours. I know of brethren all over the world, though. When you think about it, man, that's what you're a part of. 
You're a part of a kingdom of people who are made up of different ethnicities, made up of different languages, a kingdom of people that are just, I mean, we're talking people that come from different backgrounds, people that come from different home lives, people that may have been abused and battered, people that may have had it difficult, people that may have suffered far than I can possibly comprehend, but that's the people that you are a part of. And those people, no matter how hurt, no matter how broken, no matter how, how much they struggled, they are a part of a God who loves them, cares for them, nourishes them, and is a part of a people who loves them, cares for them, and nourishes them. Praise be to God, right? Who gives us, not just me, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. To be kingdom-minded is to remind yourself it's not all about me. It's not all about what I need and what I want. I'm not saying that it's wrong. Like I said earlier, Jesus is going to go into the whole concept of praying of things of your needs, things of, of your desire, things like that. But first and foremost, what is truly at the heart of our prayer? This is what he's trying to say. He's not saying when you pray, I want you to say these exact words every single time. He's saying, when you pray, have your heart like this. Because remember what he's talking about in that context. He's talking about the hearts of other people. He's saying the hypocrites, right? He's talking about those who their hearts, they, they do things just to be seen by men. They pray, they fast, they do all these things. Just they give just to be seen by men. He's going to the heart of the matter. Is your heart full of God and the kingdom? Because that is my purpose. That is your purpose, the spread of the kingdom. That my family, my extended family, family that may not be Christians, that they may hear the gospel and also become citizens of that kingdom. That my coworkers, that people that I know that are not a part of that kingdom can also be a part of that kingdom. Being kingdom-minded is a very wide scope and it helps you really see the world for what it truly is. Because when you begin to realize this earth this world may be my physical home, but man, my true citizenship is somewhere else. It shapes and it helps you focus on what truly matters in this life. And what truly matters is the souls of men at the end of the day. The souls of the people that are already a part of the kingdom, the souls are those who are outside of the kingdom. Now, as we think about this, there are numerous examples that we see in the New Testament. Numerous examples in the New Testament of what being mindful of the kingdom looks like. I told you we need to be mindful of the kingdom, right? But how does that look like? You think back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 through 47. You remember that? In Acts chapter 2, verse 40 through 47, the kingdom is established. 3,000 souls are added to that kingdom. 3,000 souls become Christians, men and women both, Jews from every nation. They say, Jeho Je Jehovah God, his son, is in fact Jesus. That he is the son of the living God. That he is the Christ. That he is the Messiah. That he is the one who takes away the sins of the world. And I need to follow him. And they become a part they became a part of that kingdom, and you see what they were doing, right? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the prayers. They continued steadfastly in mentoring each other, building each other up. They were so kingdom-minded. They saw people that had needs. What did they do? They tended to it. They didn't complain. They didn't gripe. They didn't make issues about it. They prayed about it, and they did something about it because they were kingdom-minded. When we think about other passages of Scripture, you remember in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, in the context of Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is concluding this awesome letter. You know, I think oftentimes we focus, whenever we think about the, the, the armor of Christ, right? That's in the context of Ephesians chapter 6. We think that just means for my own personal, my own personal strength, my own personal protection. But what's the whole book of Ephesians about? It's about the body of Christ. It's about the family. It's about the church. And in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, yeah, you individually put on the armor of God, right? And he goes down, if you're a kid, you remember, you know, the breastplate, you know, the, all those different, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, so on and so forth. You remember those things, but what's the whole purpose of that? To not just protect yourself, to not just be protected, but to defend your fellow soldiers as well. Because you think about in, in the military, if a soldier is not well-equipped, if he's not well-trained, he's not only a danger to himself, but who also is he a danger to? The people around him. 
And then he says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, he says, as you've sued up in the armor, this is what I want you to do. This is what Paul, inspired by God, says. He says, make petition for all the saints. He said, go to God in prayer and pray that they do the same thing. Pray for their souls. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for those that are in need of encouragement. You're suited up in the armor. You're ready to go. You know what? You're not suited up in the armor because you're out there, you know, you're out there destroying and destroy and destruction. No, you're putting on that armor to defend, to protect, to ward off, to protect your brethren, to save those that are lost. The whole purpose of that book of Ephesians, as we've been talking about in our classes, is to be mindful that you are a part of something major. That it's a lot bigger than your job. It's a lot bigger than, than you know, your, your softball league. It's a lot bigger than anything else in this world. And that's not to knock anybody who plays softball. I like softball. But it's bigger than that. It transcends all those things that you and I tend to see as, well, there's church. And then there's this. And that usually, in my life at least at times, takes more precedent than this over here at church. And yet the book of Ephesians is like, get your mind right. Jesus, in this prayer, teaching them, look, it's God and it's the kingdom, the message of the kingdom, spreading that, the gospel, helping people come to that. Helping people become fellow citizens. You know, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, as Paul's concluding this letter, he says to them, pray for us that a door of opportunity may open so that we may spread the mystery of the gospel. To be kingdom-minded is to be praying that doors open for the gospel to be able to go through. That doors open so the kingdom may continue to spread. You know, in James 5 and verse 16, James 5 talks a lot about prayer. And it talks about, you know, in that context, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But one of the things that he says in James chapter 5 and verse 16 is confess your sins to one another and pray together. Being kingdom minded, realizing that we need to talk with each other. We need to help each other out. We need to pray for one another. Being kingdom minded, being church minded, being minded of the family of God. And reminding yourself that it's not just it's not just me and God. I know there's so so many different I know there's so many people who think it's just this individualistic religion. It's not. That's what set Christianity apart in the first century. That's what sets Christianity apart today, is that it's a family of believers that serve the one true king. Now, if you're like me, there are many times in my own personal prayers, many times that I forget that prayer isn't always just about me. It's always about God, but the subject matter ought to not just be about me and my needs. Prayer is a time for us as brothers and sisters to come to connect our God to our God on behalf of one another. It's a time that we pray on behalf of the kingdom, the church. You know, once again, looking back to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Reminding us that that is what our life is like now. When you said, I've decided to become a Christian, you said, I've decided to become a part of a kingdom, of the one true everlasting kingdom in which will never fade. A kingdom that transcends time, a king that no earthly army could ever defeat, no matter what the Roman Empire tried to do, no matter what any other government had tried to do throughout the history, whether it was during the Reformation movement, the church still stood firm and was still there. And here we are today, 2,000 years later, in a completely different part of the world than what we read here, right? That's the strength and the beauty of God's kingdom that you are a part of. But do not forget that. I can't forget that either. Think about Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says Paul there is writing to them, running them to remember everything. You know, he's going through some stuff and they're suffering as well. And he's trying to help them remember our citizenship is in heaven and from it, we await a Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. So ask yourself this this morning, where does your true citizenship lie? Where does your true citizenship lie? Is it in the kingdom of God? I had a friend who, I, I always thought this would be really interesting if going through, 
I mean, I've been through international customs many times, and I also have been pulled off to the side many times uh, to, you know, for different things, you know, asking me different questions, talking to me. I'm always that guy that gets randomly picked um, for some odd reason. Um, but as far as every single time I go through the airport, you know, especially when you go through international customs, you have to have a passport with you, right? Like, I mean, you can't just waltz through. You have to have a passport with you. They'll ask you where were you from. You tell them, right? I've always thought, how, how cool would it be if... I know I would not be talking here right now if I ever said this, but how cool they ask me, where do you live? Well, my citizenship. I live on this earth, but my citizenship is in heaven. See, if I would have done that in El Salvador, we would have been having this conversation right now via webcam in some federal prison somewhere. But I didn't say that. So, you know, but you think about that, though. That is truly where it is, right? My citizenship is not really of this world. Yeah, I may be an American citizen. I may live on this world. This world is my physical home. And let's never forget that because oftentimes we forget that we live amongst people that are lost and we disconnect from them. Remember how I talked about last year I did a series on exiles? You remember Daniel, right? Daniel had a Babylonian name. Daniel had a Babylonian job. Daniel spoke the Babylonian language. Why? To be able to communicate with the people around him. But you know what Daniel never was in his heart and his soul? He was never a Babylonian. Because he recognized his true citizenship was with the people of God. You may live here, and yeah, you know, you, you work here, you speak the language, you do all that, but your true citizenship is not of this world. Never lose sight of that, especially in your prayers. Where does your true citizenship lie? And does, is it reflected in how you pray to your God? Are you mindful of the people of this congregation? Are you mindful of, of the suffering of our, brethren and, uh, our brothers and sisters all across the world? Are you mindful of, of the work that's about to begin here at this congregation, the work that's already begun at this congregation? Are you praying for the individuals that have been missing here for some time, that we miss dearly and we love so much? Because if we do that, then we're being kingdom-minded. When we're kingdom-minded, we're more evangelistic. When we're kingdom-minded, we love our brothers and sisters, and we don't let squabbles interfere with that love, right? Amen? When we're kingdom-minded, we strive side-by-side side next to each other to defend the gospel and to be able to protect those with the word of God. When we're kingdom-minded, we're pleasing in the sight of Almighty God. I want to strive to be more kingdom-minded. I want to strive to be more about the church. I want to be a 12-year-old in Luke chapter 2, said, did you not know I was to be about my father's business? I was a 12-year-old. He's Jesus. I'm a 28-year-old. I want to be able to say the same thing. Did you not know that I was about to be my king's business? That same 12-year-old grew to be about 30, 33 years old. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was at his darkest point in his life, in the garden, he recognized, we're going to talk about this more next week, but I want to emphasize this. He, he recognized that it's not my will, but the will of the Almighty King that needs to be done. You know what he was doing there in the garden? He was praying to his Father to give him the strength to be able to do the one thing that no other person on the face of the earth could do, and that was to save humanity. He was praying for God to give him the strength. He was praying that if there's any other way that this can be done, let it be done. But he recognized, but I know this is the only way and I will do it. And he did, right? Jesus went to the cross and he died brutal death. But we serve a risen savior today. You and I, he, you know, up from the grave he arose, right? It's a happy song, it's a joyous song, and it's a time for us to remember that our Savior lives, and because of that death, he's extended life to every single human being who is willing to obey, who is willing to follow him. If you are not a part of that kingdom, you know, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 through verse 28 talks about this, that those who are in Christ are those who have been baptized into Christ. And if that is not you today, you are not a part of the kingdom, but our God, the Holy King, wants you a part of his kingdom. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom. He wants you to be a part of the greatest family the world has ever known, and you can do that. Stop going through the hurt alone. Stop going through the pain alone. Stop trying to carry the sin burden by yourself, because Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And in verse 29, he says, Give me your labor and I will give you mine, for mine is easy. But you can't bear this alone. Whatever you may be lacking in this morning, we encourage you to come forward. Our King hears you and wants you to do so. Come forward as together we stand and as we sing.